maybe just give a little bit of a sense of what there is. There's, there's four or five major packages out there, um, and, they, and these have been stable for the last few years. Uh, certainly some, around, some have been around since the 80s. The metrics simply started off as a Fortran program and then turned into Windows. Um, or they rewrote it into uh, some Windows software. Basically, actually, all of these are Windows except for Kiava's toolbox, which I think is MATLAB based, so you can run on any platform. Um, they're, they're well established companies. You shouldn't have to worry about the accuracy of the me methods. So I don't consider that something that you look at. Every one of them is going to give you the correct answer. Um, but where you do start to look for differences between them is their capabilities. Can they import data? In different formats, almost all of them do accept those CSV, Excel, MATLAB files. But can they connect directly to a database? Many companies have their data in huge databases, so you don't want to first extract it from the database to a text file and then from the text file into the software. Can the software connect directly? Can it connect directly to some real time databases in your company? Can it import data from spectral instruments and near infrared probes and so on? So you, you'd have different criteria depending on your area of interest. What I find very useful is good documentation. Uh, some of the software packages come with uh, very little or poor documentation. Well, the documentation, it, it seems complete, but when you actually try to implement what they say, you don't get the answers that the software gives. So there's a discrepancy between the document and what the software is actually doing. Now that may not be too serious for you, but it does become serious when you start to try and implement these methods yourself. Um, and you want to really understand what, what's going on here, you want to put the system online, and you want to try and replicate what the software is doing in your online system. Then it becomes an issue if you can't develop, if you can't get that duplication. And where you'll find these discrepancies are with things like cost validation. Every software package does it differently, so does their documentation describe exactly how they do it? How do they do contribution calibrations, calculate the limits? How do they handle missing values? There's four or five different ways of handling missing data, and uh, some software packages allow you to choose which method it uses. Other software just implements one method and you're stuck with that. Um, but do they tell you at least what they're doing behind the scenes? What you also want is you want some good visualization. Uh, brushing, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate what brushing is, but uh, you might have seen this. If you've got two plots side by side, and you select points in one plot, do they show up as selected in the, in the plot next to it? So that's brushing. Uh, brushing is actually a good demonstration of brushing was what you saw in the image software last week. When I was moving my mouse around in the small space and in the image space, the pixels were changing colors. That's brushing. You're moving from one space to the other. And that's really powerful for visualizing data because often we can see our data clearly in one space, for example, the score space, and we want to see what those scores mean back in the original. Data. So we keep the score space open next to the original data, we move our mouse around in one space and we see it highlighted in the neighboring space. Can you recolor your plots? Can you zoom and annotate and save the plots? Can you export it to bitmaps to use in PowerPoint presentations or PDF files later on, LaTeX documents? Whatever you're writing, your thesis, can you get your data out of the software? That's an important part. Um, and this one, I've, this one you'll never really see until you try the software out. But how easy is it to rebuild the model? I find some software packages are so frustrating to go and exclude data points, rebuild, exclude, rebuild, exclude, rebuild. You know how you remove outliers just to build a monitoring system, right? If you have to do hundreds of clicks and type in things every time you just want to rebuild the model, it quickly becomes frustrating. So is the workflow of the software easy to use? So you can try that out with the, with the 30 day trials of most software. Now, some things you won't find in software packages are things like multi-block data, which we'll talk about two weeks from now. Um, can the software handle batch data, and does it do aligning of the batch data? Can it handle images? Uh, we, we had to use a separate imaging program in MATLAB to last week to do our image data analysis, but can the software do it in all in one for you? The answer currently is no, there's no software package that does everything in one, in one single coherent can you do adaptive modeling? Does it help you with validating a test set? You already saw uh, when we want to do our training data set and then we keep our test set aside, it's a little bit tedious to, to use that test set. Um, 
it doesn't, it's, it's not straightforward always, but can the software help us with validating testing data? Um, you'll see that the software that we don't even use today falls short when it comes to classification. Um, they don't give you the outputs that are suitable for building a classification model. You'll also see in today's class, we start to look at the concept of hierarchical models. You have one model, and then you use the results of that, and you cascade down to a second model. In fact, we've seen that in principal components regression, right? You have a least squares, uh, so you have a PCA model first, followed by a least squares model. So you've got to connect these two models next to each other. Can you do that in, in software packages? Mostly, they allow you to build one model, and then that model is self-contained. It can't use the data or the output from a previous model in, in, your, in, in the next model afterwards, right? So there's very little interaction between models. And where that becomes very useful is in the classifiers we'll build today. You, you build a preliminary classifier that separates A versus B, but then B is, can be split into two more groups further down. So you want these, these trees of models. So you start with the main branch, split into sub-branches, and keep going. And again, the software packages don't make that easy. We'll look in the last class of this course, we'll come to the topic of model inversion. And again, that's not done by many software packages. And then the other thing that's kind of a soft uh, requirement, but it is important in companies that where you're not the only one working on the model, is can I track the, where the data came from, who built the model, where the model has been updated, what's changed from one model to the next, which outliers have been excluded, is there maybe somewhere that you can record as the person doing the exclusion why you did it, so that if I hand the model down to someone else, and in my company this happens all the time, I inherit models from other people, but I have no idea where that data came from, who even built the original models, why they might have done certain steps, um, and then exporting that model ultimately to use online system or somewhere else. So that, so that, those are things that you might find important uh, depending on your situation. Now, if you don't use one of those other packages I mentioned earlier, these five uh, only do latent variable modeling. That's really what they're geared for. They don't do anything else. But if you come further down, you'll see here MATLAB, R, Minitab, SAS, SPSS, these are all kind of like the big statistical libraries. They'll do least squares regression, they'll do neural networks, they'll do multivariate regression, multivariate PCA, they'll do all sorts of models, but they're not focused purely on latent variables, they're just focused on statistical data analysis. So the problem with those is at best they do a very poor basic job of PCA and PLS. They, I've seen even some software packages where you can't even get a loading score out of it. You can just get the scores. So again, you have to kind of ask yourself, that if someone tries to convince you, well, we already have, say, SAS or SPSS, our company already has a license for that, why don't you use that for your latent variable model? Well, it's not going to give you everything you need, um, not to the level of the other five packages I showed you earlier. Okay. So I thought just to put that out there, uh, there were at least two or three of you that have asked for that in the course evaluations from last class, so I thought that might be useful for you. Any questions on that? Yeah. Okay, so today's class here is on classification. And I find this area really interesting. It's extremely powerful. I've seen companies make a lot of money from this very simple way of using so I'm going to start with just some basic examples and some definitions from these for the rest of the class. And actually point number two, I've taken that out today's notes. I think we probably won't have time to look at some of the classical classifiers. Uh, I can talk about them in general terms, uh, but really there we, we probably don't have time to fit that in. And furthermore, there when I say classical classifiers, I mean these are the bare basics that have been around since the 1900s. So there are things like KNN, K nearest status, linear discriminant analysis. So these tools are very, very standard statistical tools. Even if you just read the Wikipedia article on them, you'll understand it very, very well. Uh, so K, uh, I should have probably included a list in the notes, but I didn't. So for reference, for those of you that might want to look at it, K 
K and N is K nearest neighbors. Uh, linear discriminant analysis would be another one that you would look at. Those are the two basic classifiers that I would, I would start off with. But we're going to look at latent variable classifiers in today's class, three particular ones. And we're going to focus on how you can judge whether a classification model is doing what it should be doing. Um, and this is very useful when you build, say, an initial classifier and then you want to update it. You want to compare your previous iteration to your next iteration. Did I improve my predictive ability, right? Um, for those of you working on the data sets from Kaggle.com to your course project, when you're going through your iterations, you want to see, did I make an improvement on my model from one round to the next? Also, these websites uh, like Kaggle, they're ranking different people's performance. So how do, you, how do you rank with people's performance? You have to have some numeric valid way of doing that. So we'll talk a bit about that in that section. Then we'll end up with some case studies. So human love to classify things. We do this all the time. Inadvertently, you're walking around, you're mentally classifying people that you see into different groups. Um, we do that from a biological point of view as well. We look at animals, so like cats versus dogs. They both have four legs, so that's something that they have in common, but there's something that they have in different, but that, that there's different between them as well. We have the spiders and insects, and within those groups, we have subcategories. So classification is something that we've been doing for years and years and years. In the chemical area, we classify our elements by the table, periodic table, where we have groups in the columns, so group one, group two, up to the final group 18. And entries within a column uh, or within a group, they have a similar configuration of the outer electron. So for example, the halogens here, they all have similar outer electron shells with their uh, electronegativity there. And as a result of that, they behave similarly from a chemical perspective. Similarly, uh, the carbon, silicones, those two elements behave very similarly and can often be interchanged with each other. The first column over there, the single valent ions, also behave similarly from a chemical point of view. We classify them also into their rows. There's some meaning there. They have a similar number of electrons, but they have the same number of electron shells, elements within a row. But other than that, uh, we can't really say too much. But the, so it's still, it's a classification that within a row, those elements will have the same number of electron shells. Within a column, they'll have a similar behavior in their outer shell. So we're looking at classifying their similarity. When you classify things, it's based on how similar one thing is to another. That's the key concept of today's class. How similar is to a group of observations within that group? And if we bring a new observation in, can we tell if it's similar to that group or not? So let's take a look at some examples of that similarity. Um, here's a very good paper if you want to read. A very interesting application of latent variables is for detecting counterfeit drugs. Now this is a huge problem for uh, not just pharmaceutical areas, but for any type of raw material. We're, we're living in a culture where things often get quite expensive, and it sets up a market for counterfeits. Now obviously, the people that make the real deal, they don't want to be undercut by the counterfeiters, so they put a lot of effort into this sort of thing. And they've built up databases of counterfeit drugs and real drugs. What they do is they take a spectral signature of the drug or, or of the product. So if you've got the real drug, you can take your Raman spectral signature of it, and then you can go collect various fake versions of that drug on the market purchase those fake drugs and take the Raman spectral signature of those fakes as well. And what you want to do is be able to tell which ones, or not you necessarily, if you, if you know what's fake and what's not, you don't need to do it. But someone else in the future, for example, a pharmacist or uh, someone purchasing the drugs, say a, a government agency is purchasing these drugs, they want to tell whether they're purchasing something that's the real drug or if it's a, a fake version of it. And so what they can do is they can take for a new sample, they take the Raman spectra, and their first step is to tell whether this is a similar compound, 
like, is this really um, the same drug, or at least got similar characteristics to that drug? And hopefully you should meet that first criteria. If your fake is a good fake, and going to kind of emulate the, the thing that it's trying to emulate, it should have the basic features in common with it, right? So what you want to do in step one is really a similarity check, but it's a very crude and broad similarity check. Step two now is to do a difference check. Can I tell whether this real version, uh, whether this new sample I have, does it belong to the real deal, or is it one of many type of counterfeits that might be available? So in, the, in this paper, they have a nice way of doing that. Um, they have a plot where you've got a cluster of points here. This represents the real class. So this is the real drug. And then they've got a cluster over here which represents counterfeit A, another cluster here, counterfeit B. So, so two different groups have gone and counterfeited the same drug, and they've collected samples from group A, collected samples from group B, collected samples from group C as a counterfeit. And in the future, you want to first tell, step one is, let's say I've got my new observation. Does my new observation fall in this broad group? So this broad group contains all the drugs uh, for, of this particular type. So does it fit within this group? And then the second round is to tell well, is my new drug close to the real cluster, or is it close to counterfeit A, B, or C? Or is it maybe up here telling me that it's, an, it's a new counterfeit I'm seeing on the market? Uh, so it's an interesting application uh, worth, worth, worth reading about. Well, by the end of the class today, you'll understand the mechanics of what this paper is doing. So if you don't understand what this clustering is right now, don't worry. Just in, in general terms, I'm illustrating over here. We're going to go into how that paper uh, works, what the tools are that are used by that paper. For those of you doing uh, Kaggle competitions for your course projects, you would have noticed all all these, uh, at least these first two. Most of you are doing either one or the other of these. Um, both of those are classifiers. They're binary classifiers. You want to tell whether you should give a prospective client at the bank a loan or not. So the decision is yes or no, it's a binary classification. Should, uh, if I purchase this car, is it going to be a bad buy, yes or no, Buy a binary classification. Uh, Ford had a competition on that same website that's now since closed, and unfortunately the data is not available, but I think this is a really cool project. Can you tell whether the driver is alert in the car based on real-time observations of the environment, the vehicle, how the driver is operating that vehicle. So Ford uploaded those data and then had had some uh, Y variable that was either yes or no, knowing the truth. I'm not sure how they assembled that data set. And unfortunately, the other thing that Ford did when they put that data online, they, they took away the variables. They were just calling them D1, D2, D3. So you never really knew what the variables were, which ones might be interesting. But Still an interesting idea, right? Can we use information about our environment to tell uh, whether we're in one, one state or the other state? So I've got a little note there. I really recommend you go and read some of those forums, uh, especially go and look for the posts by the people who won the competitions or got close to the top. They use all sorts of really, really interesting techniques to, uh, to get that far. They don't just use multivariate methods. They often combine these methods with each other. So they'll start with a, a PCA, and then those PCA model outputs the scores, get filtered down to another more complicated model after that, like support vector machines or some nonlinear model. But it still gives you an idea for what what one can do with these tools. Now there's two areas where misclassification or, or classification is extremely extremely risky, especially um, for the legal area. So in the legal area and the medical area, we often want, we take a variety of input data and we want to make a decision. Now in the medical case, that's something like you take diagnostic tests on a patient. So you take blood tests, urine tests, x-rays, any other factors measured easily off of the human body, and some not so easily. But you use those inputs 
And if you've got more than one input, so you've got, let's say, x1, x2, x3, x4, you're using those four inputs to make a decision. Does this patient have a particular type of cancer, yes or no? You don't want to mess up that decision, right? So you want very low levels of misclassification in those, in those situations. Now, we'll talk a bit about misclassification later on. Here's another example where a trained physician or a nurse would use the signals they see here in the ECG, and they would tell, uh, they, they can identify various heart rhythms, and they can make a, a determination on whether that patient is experiencing a certain condition of the heart. And again, misclassifying will lead to the wrong treatment or, uh, or, or worse. In the legal area, the crudest form of classification is guilty or not guilty. And so if, again, they don't want to make a misclassification. And there's been a lot of um, these sorts of tools used actually in the legal area on, in, in previous court cases to make a decision on one way or the other. Here's a really exciting one I read about in the Global Mail, I think just a few days ago. A company here in India is aiming to uh, develop a TV sensor by two years from now. What they, uh, it's, TV is a big, a big uh, uh, cause of death in that area. And so what they're using is biomarkers from the breath. So just basically a simple breathalyzer type idea, breathing into a device and it will pick up certain chemical signatures in your breath and make a decision, TB or not TB. And <laughs> the advantage of this is, of course, the huge reduction in the cost, right? Because the current approach is someone has to go visit a doctor or a nurse, they have to spit, and that goes for analysis. There's a long wait time and you get your results back. So can we reduce the cost? This is costly, you're involving a lot of people. Can you distribute a very small handheld device widely through many communities that can be used to diagnose patients much faster? The faster you can diagnose them, this is a communicable disease spread by the air. Can you tr treat them faster and then lower the rate of contamination, uh, sorry, of transmission of the disease future okay. Now, the idea is being carried over to other, other uh, diagnoses, like lung cancer, pneumonia, multiple sclerosis, but also mentioned in this article. So again, it makes perfect sense, right? We've, we've heard of situations where dogs, in particular, have very sensitive sense of smell, and they can tell whether certain people have diseases. You can often read stories like that where, where a dog or a cat knows when its owner is sick, based on uh, breath. Whether that's true or not, I don't, I don't really know. I, certainly with dogs, I know that they're extremely sensitive to uh, smell. So what are they picking up? They're picking up things that are exhaled with your breath. Your body's expelling certain organic compounds in your breath, and that's being used to, um, as part of your prediction. So it's an electronic nose for TV. We also, right at the beginning of the course, I mentioned an example of an electronic nose, which they used to tell whether beef was spoiled or not spoiled. So there's a, and they were using biomarkers of various organic compounds in the smell for the packaging. Another interesting application <laughs> that appeared a few years ago, uh, Hewlett Packard made a large database of uh, emails available, and they extracted certain features out of the emails to, to tell whether that email was spam or not spam. Okay, so for those of you that have got a red mail account like uh, Yahoo, Google, Hotmail, if you have a spam folder, how is that system determining whether it's a spam or not? Certainly it's automated, it's not manual by any means. <laughs> so what they're looking for, of course, is certain words and keywords in the, e in the email. This particular database counted the number of times the word business or free or certain other words appear. They look for capitalization, uh, bad spelling and punctuation and symbols of those sorts of type. Those are various features, so they assemble a vector of 20, 30 features, so 30 columns of inputs being used to tell spam or ham. So it's either one or the other, and then it classifies it into the, the correct mailbox. So that's when you get a, a, a good email thrown into your spam folder, you've had a misclassification. Something in your, in your email 
detail that is thrown, thrown off that classifier. These classifiers are, um, a, a lot of companies use them to automatically filter out the email so you don't even ever get spam. And they've saved a lot of time and money for payroll. But uh, it's certainly very interesting to look up how they do that. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting techniques and ideas that they use there. Another emerging concept related to that that's just started to pick up this last year, I've been seeing a lot of articles on sentiment analysis, where you, where you have a computer read uh, someone's Twitter posts and other Facebook postings, and automatically determine what the general sentiment is in the population regarding a certain product or band or something. And so companies use the sentiment analysis to keep track day to day of how the public is seeing them. They obviously don't have the time to read all these Twitter posts and Facebook pages. So can you get a computer to automatically read the text and get the sentiment, the general feeling, I, I hate Best Buy, is obviously a very strong sentiment. Or I just love bread from Bakery X is obviously a, a positive sentiment. But how do you tell from that sentence a computer, how can a computer tell whether that's a positive or negative sentence? So it's very crudest form. Can we build a binary classifier in a similar way to the spam versus ham that reads text and tells positive versus negative sentence? Um, how do you deal with the linguistics behind that? Drug testing for sporting events is obviously a big, a big deal economically. This one I found really interesting. I was kind of annoyed when I read this because I obviously like. Uh, I don't know which category I would fall into, but based on these things here, yeah, it's pretty broad strokes, but the government divides us all into six categories, and they see you either as falling in, say, a law-abiding category, and those people, they looked at their features that they extracted, their features show that people that fell into this group were predominantly female, 65 plus, less educated at the time. Obviously, there's a lot of other law-abiding people that pay their taxes and not. <laughs> following that profile. But it's still interesting that, they, that they've actually gone and put in the time and effort to extract these features from hundreds and hundreds of past tax returns and, and try to classify people up this way. So you may or may not see yourself in one of these categories. You might fall into two categories. Right? I can easily see myself filling into at least two of these categories. Um, hopefully none of us are out there. <laughs> <laughs> Although reading that and looking at the class here, we probably all are. <laughs> okay, well, we're not the second least educated. I think the, uh, the, they, they, have, they have different groupings of education as well. So we definitely don't fall into that category. We probably don't fall into the lowest income group. Okay. Another interesting one I, I recently uh, saw was using image data classification. This uh, researcher in the United States took 57 paintings, uh, digitized versions of paintings by these nine artists. So these are a diverse group of artists that he selected. He just selected a 600 and 600 cropping from the center of the, of the painting, not necessarily the whole work, just a part of it. And he just put it through a huge brute force algorithm um, that he's, he's made freely available that extracts 4,000 odd features from that picture. So it will do edge statistics, shape statistics, textures, wavelet transforms, which we looked at last week. In fact, reading the article, it will take the wavelet transform of the wavelet transform of the wavelet transform. So it just, that's why you get up to 4,000, right? It's just doing a total brute force approach of extracting every possible image-based feature from that 600 by 600 region. <laughs> Just assemble this very long X matrix, um, sorry, very wide X matrix, 4,000 columns, and then 57 times nine rows, a pretty short uh, matrix. Obviously, you'll get a ton of redundancy and a lot of noise in this matrix as well. And what was really interesting was the similarities he found uh, that art, art critics don't normally group Van Gogh as the same family as Jackson Pollock, but um, if you look at some of the, the things here, I just pulled out. There's one versus the other. Yeah, you can kind of see a bit of a similarity there. But they're from diverse eras and, and ages. But it's just focused in on that very sh smallish region and said these two artists appear similar. Okay, so again, what these categories, are, what classification does is it says, I don't know necessarily even how many groupings I have. 
Like, for example, Canada Revenue Agency, when they went and they maybe, let's, let's presume they extracted these features first, and then they can do an analysis and they see six broad groups. Okay, how did they find out they even had six groups? And then secondly, once you have those groupings, how can you tell in the future a new person which grouping they might be, uh, which grouping they might belong to? Or, like I said, in my case, I might belong to two of those groups. I can kind of see myself in two of them. So those groupings are not, they're not perfectly isolated. There's overlap uh, between those groupings. You can easily have this case where you have a lot of people that could fall into more than one particular group. It's not that those six groups are perfectly isolated over here, that you can cleanly separate them. We, we will see in today's class, there's many times, or in almost all cases, there's strong overlaps between the classes. Okay, so some definitions we need to uh, use for the rest of the day here. A class is a group of observations that's coherent. Uh, that seems easy enough. I've used the term quite a few times in this course. So it's, a, it's any, any type, any similarity between a group of observations, we call that a, a class. So a class of observations. And we have a class label for them. It can either be a text or some numeric identifier that we'll use in the software, like a, a column of text that says this is, uh, let's say if we had the Canada Revenue Agency data available, we would have a column that had law abiders, and there would be the text law abider in that column for every observation that belongs to the law abider class. We call that a class label. I could also have used just a one, two, three, four, five, six, or columns just with those numeric values in it. Either way, I need some, some mechanism to tell the software which class a particular row of observation uh, belongs to. The obvious ones that you've got a no, yes, it's a zero, one. Good, bad, adequate, just a one, two, three, or you can just use a G, A, B, or something like that in, your, in the software to tell it, to tell it apart. Now, a classification model, this is a very broad concept here, but a classification model is a, a big, uh, it could be as simple as a single data variable model, or it could be a whole collection of models which together form a single classifier. But what it, it does is, it's just a black box, you can imagine it, where that when you give it k values from a new observation, it will spit out at the end of the black box a decision. It will tell you which class that new observation belongs to. Does it belong to category no or yes? Does it belong to category good, adequate, or bad? So in other words, it's a black box that takes k inputs and spits out at the end a class label for you. How it does that is what we're going to focus on in today's class. At the very basic, it's just a single latent variable model, but it might be two latent variable models used in series, one followed by another one. Or it might be a latent variable model followed by a neural network, or uh, a least squares model first followed by an SVM, or something like that, or one of those that I had done earlier, the k-nearest name. So it can be an arbitrary complex black box in here, but it takes k inputs and spits out a class label. We'll look at our classifiers in two different ways. We'll call them either unsupervised or supervised. So a supervised, uh, sorry, an unsupervised classifier is when you build that model, and we build that classification model up here. So uh, during the model building step, at no point during the model building do I use my knowledge about the class labels. I may have them. I might have them as a column, I may not even, but if, even if I do have them, the software doesn't use that information when building the model. A supervised classifier definitely uses those class labels when building the model. So we can use the terminology that we teach the model how to classify. So that's why, uh, if you want an example here, babies, they'll learn faces from birth without being told. Okay, so no, nothing's telling the child uh, who's who and who's familiar or not. They kind of just, they just learn that. They just learn that. And that's a whole separate field of study, this whole idea of how the brain learns. It's really interesting how it does that in an unsupervised manner. But certain things just cannot be 
taught, uh, uh, sorry, cannot be relied on to just naturally come about. So reading and writing are things that must be learned, and you're, you're taught that by the teacher. Um, so it's the same idea. When we build these supervised classifiers, we have the, the class label, and that class label is being used when we build the model. Somehow, we're using it. So that's the two broad definitions. The whole area of machine learning, machine learning is just a synonym for classification. Uh, the whole area of machine learning, if you look into their literature, which is a huge body of work, they'll always divide it into either an unsupervised or supervised uh, classifier. Sometimes you see this terminology pattern recognition. Uh, it's the same thing. We're trying to recognize a pattern in our data and tell which group it belongs to. Uh, machine learning, yes, it includes classifiers as one branch of machine learning, but there's also a whole other branch uh, of machine learning that's related to continuous libraries, so like least squares so is, is one uh, machine learning tool. PLS could also fall under machine learning or continuous wire. And they'll use this jargon, uh, they'll use training and generalizing. So training is model building, and generalizing is predicting. <laughs> so they, they use their own terminology for it. Uh, so they like to use the terminology that kind of has this unit element of supervised and unsupervised, implies that there's some sort of teacher hanging about. Here's the same thing, there's a training phase and there's a generalizing phase, uh, which you really just interpret building the model and using it in the future. It's, it's the same thing, just a different terms. Okay, so the objectives for building classifiers are, there's several, but for example, one question that often comes about first is, how many groups do we even have in our data? Like this, the Canada Revenue Agency, how did they know that there were six classes? Many times though, we do know that. Uh, we, we, we have our labels ahead of time. We know that our observations belong to, let's say, group A or group B, group C. So we know we've got three classes. We don't have to answer that question. But there are, there are situations where we just don't know how many groupings we're going to find. So we'll let the data naturally cluster. We'll use PCA for that. Once we've got a preliminary classifier going, we want to know why observations fall within a group. What keeps them together? What do they have that's similar amongst themselves? What is it that separates them from one group into the next? What is it, for example, in that Canada Revenue Agency that makes someone fall into the law-abiding category, say, versus the altruistic compliant? They're pretty close categories, uh, but what is it that's different between those two? Okay. The Canada Revenue Agency might even look at, let's say, let's say look at the underground economy category versus the rationalized. If we can understand why those two groupings are different, we can then maybe look at, do we, we obviously want our taxpayers to be up here, right? So they rank, these are the people that are more compliant to less compliant. Right? Okay, so what is it about the underground economy category that's different from rationalized? If we can understand that firstly, then we know what we need to change to encourage people to move from one category to the next. Is it an educational tool we need to provide to people that fall in this category? And if it is, if these people need education, or they need some information to encourage them to become more law-abiding, we know where to find them. We know we need to target females under 30 single students. <laughs> Born in Canada, okay, house of income's over 100,000, maybe not you shall think better. <laughs> So th th that's my point here, right? Once you understand your categories, you know how to move to try and move from one category to the next. Okay. In a process, if you understand why you've got cluster A versus cluster B, cluster B might have more desirable economics than group A. But first you have to understand what makes group A different from B. And then once you know that difference, then you can look to making a change to get from one group to the other. Then in the future, we, we, we get a new observation in the future. We don't necessarily know what category it belongs to. Uh, for example, in the line of credit, for those of you doing that case study, someone walks into the bank, you don't know ahead of time if they're deserving of credit or not. 
but can we get those K observations, put them into our black box, and spit out a class label at the end? Put it into our, our classification model and tell which class they fall in. Maybe is there a way to tell that they don't fall into any of our previous classes? Okay, so this is also important. We may build our classifier model up here to spit out, let's say, category A, B, or C. But we always need to take into account that in the future there might be a category D, an E, that we haven't thought of yet. Just our limited training data hasn't shown any examples of that. But we always need to have the capability in our classifiers to be able to handle the new future class that we haven't necessarily seen yet. So one way to think about our data is as follows. When we're looking at this classification, we, we build, um, we've got our data in the training phase up here. So this is the offline phase, and then we've got our part here where we use it, say, online, or we use it in the future. So today, you've, you've got up to this point, you've got your, your data sets. You've got N1 observations that come from group one. You've got N2 observations from class two etc. up to NG observations from class G. And in the future what we're going to do is we're going to bring in this new observation, also K measurements, and we're going to apply it to these models, or it might, might be a single model, doesn't, we're going to look at that next, and we're going to ask, does it, my observation fall into group 1, group 2, group G, or is it perhaps a new observation, uh, sorry, is it from a new class that I've, I've never seen? So, okay, maybe let's take a break here.